through the miracles of modern technology, through the walls of time and the portals of history, please welcome Arnold Schofield, also known as John Brown. Thank you, Becky, for those kind words. Thank you very much, for ladies and gentlemen, for asking me, inviting me to be here. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to spend about 10 minutes just sharing some observations about John Brown. And uh, then I'll exit and I'll come back and be John Brown for about 20 or 25 minutes. And then I'll be happy to answer any questions any of you may have. I'd like to begin by really, again, thanking you for having me here because uh, I live in Fort Scott, Kansas, which is a few miles east of here on the Missouri border. And one of the joys of coming to Wichita for me is to drive through the Flint Hills. They are absolutely beautiful. I love them. And this time of the year, the grass isn't quite belly up to the cows, but they're grazing. The ponds are all filled with water. And it is absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's a joy for me to travel across the Flint Hills. And I do it two or three times a year. Uh, John Brown is a very interesting man in Kansas history. He wasn't here for a long period of time, and he was here during the era of bleeding Kansas from 1855 to 61. At that time, the question is, does Kansas become a slave state or a free state? And John Brown was an abolitionist, a very strong abolitionist. In fact, he was a zealot. He believed in dying for what he believed in, and he expected every man of his company to do the same. Now, Kansas at that time was filled with many settlers who were pro-Southern and many who were pro-Northern. But in the beginning, in 1855-56, the majority were pro-Southern. That changes by 1858. And uh, John Brown is perceived then and now in two basic ways. If you were of the Southern persuasion, south of the Mason-Dixon line, and I mean by that that you did not necessarily own slaves, but you were of the Southern lifestyle in the social structure. You might have been a small farmer, didn't own any slaves or anything like that. But if you're of the Southern persuasion, the notoriety of John Brown in Kansas when it makes the newspapers, and believe me, it makes the newspapers. If you're of the Southern persuasion, he's a sinner. He's a traitor. If you're of the Northern persuasion, he's a patriot, and some considered him a saint in that context. Now, I would clarify that briefly. He was a patriot, but he was certainly not a saint. He was a man of many characteristics, and he could be very gentle, he could be very bombastic, he could be very mean all rolled into one. And the abolitionist party of the North was divided. You had many abolitionists who believed that the question of slavery could be answered peaceably, that it was just a matter of time. 
And the other faction supported John Brown in his violent endeavors in bleeding Kansas. And John Brown considered what was going on in bleeding Kansas a war. It was a war against the slavery concept and he would fight to maintain or to establish Kansas as a free state. And he was willing to die for that. He was a zealot. He was an extreme abolitionist. In today's world, he would be classified as a terrorist. He was willing to fight and die for what he believed in. And I would like to think that if he were here today, he would be in the Middle East and he would be fighting the ISIS movement not in an organized military army, but he would have a band of what he called freedom fighters that he led during Bleeding Kansas. His time here was relatively short. What I will do, uh, my impression for you today, is John Brown, in January of 1859, and he's getting ready to leave Kansas. But he will give you a summary of why he was here, what he did here, and the consequences of same. A couple more things about John Brown. Most of you, or at least myself, I was raised in Massachusetts. I'm a blue belly Billy Yank so to speak. But the point is, when I was coming up through high school and junior college, Bleeding Kansas might have had one page in the textbook. And on that one page, John Brown might be mentioned in a paragraph, and that would be the extent of it. Now things have changed, especially here in Kansas, because we have the guidelines in school now, so Kansas history is taught. So the era of bleeding Kansas is uh, focused upon. Back to Mr. Brown. Many of you are probably aware of the thing that gained him the most notoriety, and that was his attack on Harpers Ferry, Virginia, where he attacked the arsenal to secure weapons to lead an insurrection by slaves. And he actually believed that this would happen. Harper's Ferry is at the confluence of the Shenandoah and the Potomac River. And the Shenandoah River flows from south to north and is in the Shenandoah Valley. At that time, that was considered the eastern part of Western Virginia. Not West Virginia, the state. That did not happen until 1863. But Brown's plan was to capture the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, arm his party, and go into the mountains on the west side of the Shenandoah Valley. And he was to establish stations along the mountain range. Now I'm sure many of you have heard of the Appalachian Trail. Maybe some of you have actually hiked it. It goes from western Georgia all the way north to the state of Maine, passing through western South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland into Pennsylvania, New York, New Hampshire, and then Maine little bit of Vermont. What Brown thought he would do 
along that mountain range was to establish what he called stations. And the station would consist of a small building, a log structure. And they would be spaced about 20 to 25 miles apart. And then when the slaves left their farms and plantations, they would rendezvous at these stations and he would arm them and create an army. Now that sounds very naive today, I understand that. But he actually believed that. And I'll close the introduction with one other thing. In Lynn County, Kansas, just northeast of Trading Post, which is on Highway 69, there's an area called the Mary Decene Massacre Site. And this is an event that occurred in 1858, has nothing to do with John Brown. But on the same land where that event occurred, he either rented or purchased a small piece of ground and he built a single story structure underneath a bluff so it was not visible. It was what they called John Brown's Fort. He didn't call it that. That structure was less than three miles from the Missouri border, which is a slave state. Was a slave state, a divided state. And what happened in late December 1858, when Brown and his men were at that structure or cabin, a slave appeared at his door and asked him to rescue the slave's family and extended family from their bondage in Missouri which was less than, the farms were less than four miles away. So he did that. Now if you're of the southern persuasion, he stole those slaves. If you're of the northern persuasion, he rescued them from bondage. And he brought them to this structure. And then, he escorted them on the Underground Railroad, and many of you know about that, I'm sure. It was not underground, <laughs> and it didn't have steam engines pulling the train. It was a clandestine way of moving African Americans from one point to another. And what John Brown did with this group of approximately 20 slaves, and he said, wait a minute. How can you say approximately? Thanks. Well, that's what he said because two of the women were pregnant. So he started out with 20 and he ended up with 21. And the baby was named after him, John Brown. But he took these slaves on a journey from eastern Kansas to Lawrence to Topeka north to Holton and across southern Nebraska, Nebraska City, then across the state of Iowa to the Mississippi River, and then across Illinois and across into Michigan to Detroit. And from Detroit, they took a steamboat to Canada, and that's where these slaves were settled in a village that was their destination. And that's what I will conclude the program about John Brown's trip. So right now, I'm gonna excuse myself. It's gonna take about five or six minutes and then I'll be John Brown for you. My name is Brown. Some of you of the Southern Persuasion believe in that peculiar institution called slavery, call me Crazy Brown. Others call me Old Man Brown. Others have called me Shubal Morgan. A 
Others have called me John Smith. Today, January 1859, I am Captain John Brown. I command a company of freedom fighters who've been waging war in Kansas since 1856. In the summer of 1855, I received a letter from Owen Brown, my son, who along with his wife and other family members came to Kansas. And in the summer of 55, he wrote to me in Ohio, and he said, Father, please come to Kansas. Please bring weapons, because if you don't, we will all be dead by December. So, another son, Frederick, and I took a one-horse wagon, and we loaded it up with farm implements and what weapons I had. And this was in Ohio. And we left Ohio, heading for Missouri and Kansas territory. The last stop we made in Ohio, I was asked to give a speech of which I received a few dollars. But when the speech was over, a gentleman approached me and said, I don't have any money, but come outside. I have something I want to give you. We went outside to his wife, and he threw over a tarp. It was a wooden crate. He opened it and he said, I think you could use these. And what he was talking about was this. It is an artillery short sword used by the United States Army. He was a retired Army officer in the Ordnance <coughs> Department. And he gave me a crate full of these. This is an interesting weapon. It is not a sticking weapon. It is a maiming weapon to break bones. And it will. It is a weapon that is passed down to the ages of time. Moses and his army used this weapon to defend themselves. The Romans used it against the barbarians. The Christian crusaders used it on the Iberian Peninsula against the Muslim hordes coming in from North Africa. It's been used in every conflict. In our American Revolution, our Mexican-American War, and it is now being used in the war in Kansas. Everything went fine until we crossed into Missouri. It was early one foggy morning and we were getting ready to cross the stream, the ford, and we had to stop the horse. And out of the fog, this figure emerges, and he says, where are you going? Well, I wasn't going to lie to him. I said, we're going to Kansas Territory. He said, where do you have in that wife? I said, it's none of your damn business what's in that wife. He said, 
If it's weapons, you'll never get out of Missouri alive. I said, oh, is that right? And I happened to have this revolver down in the boot in front of me. And I reached down and I picked it up and I pointed it right at his head. And I said, you'll be the first to die. You know what he did? He backed off and disappeared in the fall. And we continued on our way to the Kansas Territory. And when we got to the Brown Homestead on the Pottawatomie Creek, we found the family and they were all sick. All sick with the fever. And I said, son, why didn't your neighbors help? And he said, they're not going to help us because they want us dead. I said, oh. He says, that's right. They're pro-slave. I said, well, as long as they mind their own business, we'll mind ours. Family came back to health. In 1856 was the most violent year. It started when a band of border ruffians from Missouri, led by a sheriff who was deputized by the pro-slave governor of Kansas, took him into Lawrence. And their goal was to destroy Lawrence. They didn't completely destroy it. They burned half of it to the ground. And when we got worried of what was going on. We decided to leave and go to Lawrence. We were only halfway. And messages were coming down saying, there's no need, there's no need, Captain Brown. What do you mean there's no need? He says, there's a truce. I said, a truce? He said, yes, the border ruffians have agreed to go back to Missouri and leave the rest of Lawrence. I said, did you fight? He said, no, not really. We couldn't fight him. That was very discouraging. So we returned to the homestead. Now you know one of the quickest ways to learn some things is you learn it from the women folk. Uh-huh. Well, our women folk kept com coming to us and telling us that we had best leave. Because if we didn't leave, we'd all be killed in the night. I said, is that a fact? I don't wait to be attacked. I attack. A couple nights later, no moon. We went to two neighboring farmsteads, dragged those pro-slavers right out of their homes, and killed them with the broadswords. One thing about a blade, it's quiet. It doesn't make a loud noise. And we cut them up and left them for the hogs. They never attacked our homestead. Then the governor of Kansas puts out a warrant for my arrest. 
Well, it was never executed because I'm still here. <laughs> and in June of the same year, a man from Missouri by the name of Henry Pate was deputized by the governor to lead a posse to arrest me and my sons. They had camped at a place called Black Jack Spring on the Santa Fe Trail. Not far from a town called Baldwin City. It was early in the morning when we attacked. And they had us outnumbered. But we had the element of surprise. So we formed a semicircle around their camp and started to fire into their camp. And we were using what some folks call the Beecher's Bible. The Reverend Henry Ward Beecher was a friend of mine, is, and he shipped boxes of Bibles to the Kansas Territory. Aha! That's what the box said. And nobody bothered to open it. The boxes from a good Christian minister. Inside were sharks, carbines, and rifles. The best that could be made. And I and some of my men were armed with this weapon. And what I had to tell them was when you shoot, you shoot named Low! because you're going to pull up because you're not trained as soldiers. And if you shoot low and come up, you might hit them in the gut. Forget about a headshot because you're not that good. And if you hit them in the stomach or a limb, you'll knock them down. You won't kill them. But they'll feel the pain. As I say, we were outnumbered. And things were going against us. And then our son, my son Frederick, rides through the center of the battlefield and yells, Father, Father, reinforcements are here. And he gallops off. Well, the shooting stopped. And the next thing that happens is a flag of truce comes up and approaches our line. And the gentleman said, my commander wants to know what your terms are. I said, your commander? Go back and get him. I don't talk to anyone but your commander. So he brings up Henry Pate. And he wants to know what are my terms of surrender to him or of him. And I said, completely unconditional. You lay down your arms. All your weapons were laid down and you surrender. He said, that's totally unacceptable to me. I said, oh, really? Is that right? Then I grabbed him by the collar, and I pulled him up on his toes, and I took this revolver and put it in his ear. And I could smell that ear hair burning. And I said, now tell him to surrender, or I'll blow your brains out. Guess what he did? They surrendered. Yes, they did. 
I don't know what happened to him, but as a prisoner, we turned him and his men over to the United States Army. And there was a uh, lieutenant there whose last name was Stuart. And I heard him called Jeff Stuart. We could have killed him, but we didn't. We let him go. I kept, however, a souvenir. Henry Pate's Bowie knife. It's very small, because if you take that blade and you enlarge it and you forge it, it will be forged into pikes. The tip of a pike that we'll use to arm some slaves with, eventually. There was one other fight, and that was in August of that year at a place called Osawatomi Camp territory. The border ruffians come back again and again they burn half of the town because it like Lawrence had a reputation of being an abolitionist town. My men and I helped defend Osawatomi and save the other half of the town. Hence, many folks call me Osawatomie Brown. But there was a tragedy there at Osawatomie. Uh huh. My son Frederick got separated. And he was walking down the road, and all the fighting was over. And he was approached by a group of horsemen. And one of them said, you're brown. He raised his hands. And he couldn't get, yes, I am out before the man shot him in the head and killed him right there. And they rode on. I left Kansas in October 1856. And I went back east to Boston, Massachusetts. And in Boston, there are a group of men who are my friends. You may have heard about them. They were called the Secret Six because they were kind enough to provide us with funds to carry on that war in Kansas. I did receive some funds. I came back to Kansas. And then, in December of 1858, I was approached by another patriot by the name of James Montgomery. And he was an abolitionist as well. He led a group of men called the Little Osages, called the Osages, because they all lived in the Little Osage River Valley in northeastern Bourbon County. So when they came to Fort Scott and were raiding Fort Scott, which was a pro-southern town, the cry would go up, the Osages are coming, the Osages are coming. What are you talking about it? the Indian Osages. James Montgomery asked me and my men to accompany him on a raid on Fort Scott. And on December 17, 1858, we were on the outskirts of Fort Scott and we had a meeting. And it was known that it was a pro-southern town. And I wanted to burn it to the ground, burn every building in it. But James Montgomery said, no, there are some good loyal men and women in Fort Scott. And we're not going to burn every building. I'm going there to rescue one of my men who was incarcerated in Fort Scott. But we're not going to burn the town. 
So he asked for a boat, and we were outnumbered. So Montgomery's men won, and we did not accompany him to Fort Scott. But he went. He got there early in the morning, pulled the people out of their beds and rooms in their night clothes, the pro-Southern folks, put them in a ring, and he said, I've come to rescue my man. Right. And you have a choice. Your choice is simple. You can give him to me, or you'll die, and I'll take him. And they gave him to him. <laughs> Good choice. Good choice. <laughs> now, I had a building not far from the Meredith River, and I was approached one night by a slave. And the slave asked me to come rescue with my men, his family, and other slaves about four miles away in Missouri, which we did. We now have them, and we're on a long journey. We're going from eastern Kansas to southeast Nebraska, across Iowa, across Illinois, across Michigan, and then on a steamboat to Canada, where they will be free, and I will meet more of my men. We have another mission. We're going to a place in Virginia called Harper's Ferry. But I know there are some pro-Southern folks here, so that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I will say one other thing. This has been and is a holy war in Kansas. It is a war that preludes a war that's coming that will be bigger than you can ever imagine. And the war that comes, slavery will be purged from that land with the blood of your husband, your sons, your brothers, your uncles. But it will be gone. Thank you, John Ray. Oh, yes, I do. <laughs> it's been uh, advertised. And how many of you take the Smithsonian Magazine? OK. I want you to go back maybe two or three issues in the Smithsonian Magazine. And there's a feature article on this movie. And people find it hard to believe that what happened in Mississippi with this group of individuals did indeed happen. And yes, it did. They formed their own area, black and white, and they defended their homes against Confederate forces. They were not in the Union Army. <laughs> they were civilians defending their homes in the area that they called home. Now, if you read that article in the Smithsonian, it's very well done. The movie's very well done. I'm looking forward to it, seeing it. And the reporter and photographers went to central Mississippi to where this actually happened. 
And yes, cemetery is there. Yes, the graves of former slaves are there with the white inhabitants as well, by families. But the interesting thing, now, I was raised in Massachusetts with a northern view, I guess. But I went to college and was trained as a historian, and I should have an objective view of things. I should be able to understand both sides, which I tried to do. And my point is, when this reporter and photographer were in central Mississippi, where this actually occurred, they went to the local historical societies because they wanted to talk to people about it. Not too very many would talk to them. One or two would who happened to be descendants, white and black, who lived in that episode. And they talked to members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Now, I am not just urging the Sons of Confederate Veterans in this comment, okay? But they tried to talk to the commander of that camp who wouldn't make himself available. So they had to talk to an adjutant. And when they talked to the adjutant, the adjutant said they were nothing but white scum, they were deserters from the army, and what you're doing is just false. It never happened. Oh. And that's the reaction that that reporter and photographer received. And when you read the article, and please do, it is very well done. It is not bias by any means, and it just explained what happened. And I'm looking forward to the movie. Thank you for the question. Another question. Thank you for being with us today. I was wondering what kind of moral or legal authority John Brown felt he had when he went forth as a commander or the captain. Legal authority, he had none. Moral authority, he took it upon himself, as did many of the men in the era of bleeding Kansas. Both the pro-slave men who were fighting and the free state men and abolitionists, and they're two different groups. The free staters wanted Kansas to be a free state, but it didn't matter to them that slavery might exist somewhere else, but not in Kansas. And they became aligned with the abolitionists who wanted slavery gone. But as far as his legal authority being commissioned by someone, no. It was his own personal doing. Any other questions? Yes, uh, John, um, when uh, Franklin Pierce ran for president, did you support him? And how about James Buchanan? What do you think of those two presidents? Could you give us your impression of what they did good and what they did bad. <laughs> There's been a term called do nothing presidents. And I would put Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan in that group. Now what Buchanan wanted to do he wanted to avoid war however he could. But uh, was I supporter of either one? Absolutely not. And my memory fails me as to something good they may have done. Yes, sir. It's a historical fact that Alabama was one of the first states to secede from the Union. And Winston County, Alabama, after that occurred, seceded from Alabama. 
I'm curious in terms of if you might have any comment on that and, uh, and go on on the prevalence. I mean, it is a historical fact that after Lincoln's assassination, Andrew Johnson was from Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Uh, the movie that was just mentioned about Mississippi, I would suggest to you that in northern Alabama, northern Georgia, western North Carolina, eastern Tennessee, there were pockets of individuals who did not believe in the dissolution of the Union. They, for the most part, were mountain folks, farmers, and they were different than the planter class, if you will, of southern Alabama, southern Georgia, eastern South Carolina. So there were pockets of resistance throughout the South in those states. And uh, those areas also had very violent guerrilla war actions. But none of those areas compared with the brutal, barbaric guerrilla war that went on in Missouri during the war. But uh, yes, there were. They did exist. And uh, in retrospect, that is one reason that the Confederacy failed, because it was not completely united. And that's the best I can do, sir. Yes, sir. Kind of a question, I don't know if this has ever come up before, but were those that were for a free state of Kansas, not, not the abolitionists, but just the free staters, was it because they didn't want blacks or African Americans in Kansas? Because it seems like over the years we have not had a very large population, despite the fact that early on we were a free state. I wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, The free staters did not want African Americans in the Kansas Territory or in the state of Kansas. Now, there were two large migrations of African Americans into Kansas, large. One, of course, was during the Civil War. You had refugees coming in from Missouri. You had them coming up from Arkansas, the Indian Territory, and uh, which is now Oklahoma, and some even from Texas to get away from the war. And once the war was over, many of those refugees did not stay in Kansas. They they went to other places, not south, but further north and west. Now, the second large migration or immigration to Kansas was after the Civil War, it was called the Exoduster Movement. And that's in the late, well, it's in the 1870s right up to about 1882. And that, again, when there was large, a large movement of African Americans who had become tenant farmers in the South, which was one step above slavery because they were always in debt. But they left and they came up the Missouri River, uh, Can uh, Mississippi River Valley and the Arkansas River Valley, or if you're in Arkansas, <laughs> the Arkansas River. But the point is they came up the river valleys and the M Missouri River Valley and there were men like Pop Singleton, who actually gathered groups of African Americans and had them come to Kansas, and he set them up into what they called colonies. And there were some in southeastern Kansas, and the only one that really survived for any length of time was near Coffeyville, Kansas. But you may have heard of the one up in real northwestern Kansas called Nicodemus, 
But that was in the exoduster movement. Uh, but that occurred after the war. Any other questions? Well, uh, my family had farms all along the Pottawatomie Creek, is what they called it. The yes, ma'am. And uh, Lane, Kansas, and Lane, were you, was John Brown ever involved in anything in Lane? <laughs> not in Lane, and Lane, of course, is named after James Henry Lane. I have a number of favorite characters in Kansas history. John Brown is one. I do another program that I call Rogues, Rascals, and Renegades, and there are three featured in that program. I don't do an impression of each, mind you. But those three figures are James Montgomery, Charles Doc Jennison, and of course, James Henry Lane, which is, he was quite an individual. I'm gonna try to squeeze in one last question. Okay, yes, sir. You know, in terms of um, Revolutionary War patriots, mm -hmm. we revere folks like that. Uh, it's only common sense, give me liberty or give me death. Uh, in terms of your own freedom fighting, why aren't you more highly regarded? <laughs> well, that depends where you're from when you're uh, asking about me, John Brown. Uh, John Brown did make the national news. Uh, as a result of the Pottawatomie Massacre, that's what it was called. And it depends on where you were, or where I was. Uh, in the North, I was considered to be a patriot. In the South, I was considered to be uh, a sinner, to be polite. And uh, there were many episodes in Bleeding Kansas that uh, one does not hear about. Uh, a friend, a dear friend of mine, who's a retired chief historian of the National Park Service, Ed Bars, some of you may know of him, he said, John Brown and the spark that he ignited in Kansas became the inferno that was our Civil War. Now there were others, but Brown's right up there. Uh, having said that, Brown is still considered, if you read the textbooks, <laughs> a footnote in American history. He was much bigger than a footnote. He deserves much more than a footnote. Will he ever receive that? I doubt it, but be that as it may, that's the way it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna.